So let me begin by reading Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to begin with verse 21. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. This morning, I want to bring a message entitled, Christmas is over, now what? Christmas is over, now what? You may be seated. For the last year and a half, say, to two years, it has been chaotic, to say the least. I am of the opinion that this Christmas season could not have arrived at a better time. It was a welcome distraction away from everything that has been transpiring in and around our lives. All around us has seemed to quieten down or at the very least, it has taken a back seat to what is happening right here in this moment. Nothing else seems to matter and has lost its importance. You see, it was during this time in one of our family gatherings, we played a Christmas version of Family Feud. Steph was Steve Harvey. <laughs> Get that image in your head. And do I, though I do not recall the exact wording, uh, a couple of the questions that were asked, that, that's kind of what spurred my thoughts for today. You see, we were to name the top seven pieces of the nativity. Or the top eight items or what comes into our mind when we begin to think about Christmas. And as we were playing this game, I began to think about how our focus has at least been redirected. You see, we have become so focused on spending time together, giving to others, well, gathering as a family, or maybe even learning more about the nativity, that we are no longer concerned about what has been distracting many of us, which are world events. Too many were probably unaware but for this particular moment of time, people have become focused, say, on what the true meaning of Christmas is all about. It is no longer about what may divide us, but rather what we have in common that unites us as a people. If it was as if for just if, if it was just for a brief moment of time, it was as if Christ spoke. Peace be still once more. And it was truthfully a silent night. In Luke 2 verse 20 it says that the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. So Christmas is over. Now what? Well, for Mary and Joseph, they were left and alone in a stable with a newborn baby. The sound of the shepherds praising and worshiping were beginning to, or, or were fading in the distance until they could no longer be heard. By all accounts, it would be at least 40 days, but less than two years before the wise men would arrive and worship and bless the family with their gifts. Now, to my knowledge, there are no additional records of any other visitors or people coming to worship His birth. So Mary and Joseph, they were left all alone with only the sounds of the animals comforting them that night. You see, it's within this 40-day period that I wish to focus this morning. See, you would have thought that after the shepherds left the evening prior, many would come and witness the proclamation of the shepherds that Messiah has been born. 
Just as it's been prophesied, He is wrapped in swaddling cloths. He is lying in a manger. But what we tend to overlook is that according to the law, Mary was deemed unclean for 40 days. If anyone came around or in contact with her, they would have been considered unclean as well. So this would not have only halted any visitors, but could also possibly be the reason why God delayed the wise men. See, this does not mean uh, that, that, that Mary and Joseph were not busy. You see, this young couple had many obligations that must be performed, uh, which had been prescribed within the law of Moses or the law of God itself. And so keeping with the text, that Christ came and fulfilled every aspect of that law. You see, there were certain rituals, and certain rites that were to be carried out in the dedication of the child, but also to begin the process in which Mary would have been considered clean. And it is within this process that I find most interesting, as it carries with it many spiritual truths which I believe not only can we learn from today, but I believe, I, I'm hoping that it'll build your faith. Truths that will carry us, uh, that, that will carry us as we now find ourselves storing those decorations for another year and also wondering and asking ourselves the questions, now what do we do? Look with me, verse 21, first half. It says when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child. So let's begin to break down what's happening after Christmas, after the birth of Christ. Well, it is required by law that every male child who wanted to practice the faith in Judaism to be circumcised. And it happens somewhere the seventh or the eighth day, right, right in that time frame. Well, we know according to Scripture and according to Genesis 17, that God made a covenant promise with Abraham. And part of the symbol of that covenant promise would be the sign or the seal of circumcision of the male children as they were being born. So circumcision is just not something for health purposes that, that many doctors would tell you today. At that time, God used it as a symbol or as a seal that these people and these people are alone or in covenant agreement with me. It also stood as a symbol, when we dig into this in a moment, that the circumcision is symbolic or representative of the sin being removed from a person's life. And like most of their rituals, most of their rites, most of the things that the Jewish people did, and, and what they carried on in the temple that day, at that time of the birth of Christ, all these things lost their meaning and lost their purpose. They had, uh, they had been doing it since the time of Abraham. They stopped for a period of time as they were out of covenant, but before they could enter the promised land with Joshua, remember all the, first, all the male children had to be circumcised before they could go in and claim their inheritance. That ritual and rite was carried on from the time of Joshua. We see it going on even to the time of Christ, even going on today. They still practice it. But they have forgotten that it is not just a rite or ritual, but this is a sign or a covenant or a, not a, I don't hate to use the word deal, but it, it is a promise given by God to Father Abraham. And as this rite and ritual continues to go on, it's supposed to remind the Jewish people of the promise that God has given them. And that God is not slack concerning not one promise. You see, this rite of circumcision is a perpetual covenant to remind them of the blood covenant God made, and it's still effective today. So, what does this uh, rite of circumcision, and, and what does it mean? Well, for us, and, well, let's, let's I can look at this point. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. And this is when Moses is... is uh, He's given them the law. This is what's going to govern us. This is what we're going to do from this day forward. And he tells them in verse 16, because of all this, you know, the therefore there, he says, the things that precede it, therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart 
and be stiff-necked no longer. You see, Moses even recognized at that time that they would even forget what circumcision means. And he says, look, you can do all the outward circumcision, the rites and the rituals of it, but if you do not circumcise your heart, if you do not circumcise who you are, you're still living and walking in sin. Though the outward appears right, it's all on the inside. And that's what, look, Moses knew. And Moses was telling them this. You see, Moses was reminding them, this is all about the heart. Every rite, every ritual, every law that God has made, it all goes back to dealing with the heart of the people. And see, (laughs) if those who are passing laws and those who sit on our court system would look at it in light of, we don't need another law, we need revival. You see, it's not about passing another law or or, or continuing to place the people more under the bondage of a law because the people just become more stiff-necked. Time has proven that. The Jewish people throughout Scripture proves that. But what we must understand is not about the law. Let's get to the heart of the matter. And that's the sin that is in the heart of people. The sin that we deal with on a daily basis. The flesh that keeps coming back up. And until we deal with the flesh, the law, or the Word of God, or any of it, means nothing. You see, when Moses is talking in Deuteronomy about circumcising the heart, he's first of all saying, you need to bring every thought under subjection and under the rule of God. If it's not good, we need to get it out. Because Scripture says that all things work together for good for them who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. So if all things are working together for good, we've got to get the stinking thinking out of our mind and begin to think on those things that are pure, holy, just, and of a good report. In other words, we must concentrate on thus says the Lord God and forget what thus says our senators, our representatives, or all those who speak contradictory to the Word of God. It is thus, look, you need peace and comfort in your mind in a turbulent world. Get your mind set on those things above and not on those things beneath. Because Scripture says, where where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord. Our help comes from that who is uh, who, he who is sitting on the throne, who is high and lifted up. Quit looking down and start looking up, because looking up says that is where our redemption comes from, and your redemption is drawing nigh according to Scripture. I bet y'all didn't think y'all were getting one of these after Christmas, did you? Well, hold on, brother. This gets better from here. Let me tell you the other thing he says you got to circumcise. Get rid of your bad attitude. You see, get rid of all the negative speaking and all the negative thinking because James teaches us that life and death is in the power of the tongue. And you wonder why everything is going so horrible in your life right now. Well, maybe you spoke it into existence. Because the Word of God says it is alive, it is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. So when you begin to speak, he says there is life and death. You either speak life or you speak death, but you're speaking one or the other. And so when you continue to say, oh, everything is gone. There's no coming back. Oh, everything. Well, guess what? You're speaking out. Instead of saying, you know what? I'm not concerned with this anymore because I have placed all this in the hands of my God and my God determines the future. And I'm trusting Him with the outcome. You know, it's about getting rid of that bad attitude of saying, Oh my Lord, it can can get get worse if you keep saying it's going to get worse. It's about saying, My God, who has never left me nor nor forsaken me, who walks closer to me than than my own brother, in my Lord do I trust day and night. He is my source of hope. He is my joy. He is my peace. And He is the one. Look, I'm not concerned about everything else that's going on. I am concerned about what does my God think and say about me. Look, I'm looking unto Him. Look, if we change our attitude, then the outlook doesn't look so bad because we know who has determined the outcome. (laughs) 
Let me tell you something else we've got to get rid of. That hidden sin. We need to lay them down before God. Now, please do not come up to me today and just start confessing like the little kid in that movie Goonies. When they asked him what he do wrong, and he went back to the time he was born and just laid it all out. That's between you and God. But what we must do is get down before our God. Because remember, you're a vessel and a temple of the Spirit of God. And all vessels that were used in the service of God and in the temple of God were sanctified for the glory of God. In other words, they could not be devoured. There was a process they went through. And so what we must do as temples and vessels of God is to get down before our God, whether it's in the altar of God or whether the altar in our home that, that we make, the secret place we go, and just say, God, I need you to search this vessel right now. I know my thinking's not right. My attitude's not right. I'm ill all the time. I'm blowing everybody out. And you know, I, I'm just not presenting you in the best. So something's amiss in my life. Something's not right with this vessel. And so, God, I need you to search me and know me now. As the psalmist said in Psalm 51, creating me a pure and clean heart, but do not allow your spirit to depart from me. You see, the Spirit of God cannot dwell in a vessel that is unclean and undefiled. So we must get this vessel undefiled. And we do so by saying, God, search me and know me now. Remove the sin from my life. And I plead the blood of Christ over this vessel right now. Purge it from all righteousness. Purge it from all uncleanliness. And then fill me with the anointing, a fresh oil and a new wine from, the, from your throne, the Spirit of God. And fill this vessel fresh and new like you've never have before. Confess all those sins. Lay them before God. And when God says He cast them into the sea, never to be remembered no more, quit going back and fishing in the sea of, of, of forgetfulness and bringing those things. Because Scripture says when you bring those things back up that God has thrown there, you're trampling the blood of Christ fresh and new. He's saying when He's cast those things into the sea, you forget about them, you move on, they're under the blood of Christ, He's not going to bring them back up. Your adversary is bringing them back up because he's trying to get you to let go of the faith. He's trying to get you deep, down, disgusted, depressed, agitated, anxiety, fear, doubt. He's trying to break your faith. He's trying to get you to walk away from God. And we got to just be willing to say, Lord, this vessel is yours. Do with it as you will. Help me to stand and withstand in this evil day because my adversary has come against me with both fists and both feet and I don't know how I can stand. And then God reminds us, oh, he's the one bringing up your past, but I have written it. Look, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Remind him of what his future is. Deals with the heart, circumcision. Philippians 3.3 3 says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Jesus Christ, and have no confidence in the flesh. So what we have in the circumcision is we have a picture. It is a sign and symbol of the covenant God made with Abraham, first and foremost. But as I was reading this, and let me make sure I got this right, it was uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse. He, he said this quote, and, and I've never looked at this, this period like this before. And this is his quote. He says that Christ's circumcision was his first suffering for us. And I've never thought of it like that before. Because here he is, the, the Lamb of God born to take away the sins of this world. And eight days after his birth, he's circumcised. The shedding of that blood for the covenant, but we also realize it's that same blood would be for the remission of sin. We already begin to see the purpose of why he came, why he was born, why he died, and why he bled on the cross. You see, even in this ritual, we see that glimpse of the cross that we cannot forget. The atoning work and the, and the atonement of the blood of Jesus Christ laid on the altar of God once and for all, for all of mankind's sin. But here is what I, I don't want us to miss, because I, I want us to go into next year, I mean, just totally different. I want us to go in expecting and with high anticipation of what God's getting ready to do. I really do. 
Because let me tell you what cannot happen without circumcision. It says specifically, that was Paul writing to the church at Philippi. Right there in 3.3, 3, there's no way you can worship God in the Spirit. There's, scripture says to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And you cannot worship Him in spirit and in truth if you have not circumcised your heart. And there's a difference between worship because you can fake worship. And then there's worship in spirit. Being led by the power and the spirit of God. And there's nothing like it on the face of this earth. And if you ever experience it just one time, there's no way you'll ever look for anything else anywhere else. If we go into this year with nothing else on our mind, we need to go in saying, God, I need you. And do we need to do it daily. God, I need you to search me. You know, because I have got to get rid of this flesh. Crucify my flesh right now so what I can live for you. But there's no way we can worship God without circumcision. We cannot do it. Paul goes on to say, we cannot rejoice or worship or rejoice in Jesus Christ without circumcision. Think about those shepherds. And think about those wise men in the context of the nativity. And they go there, and when they come to the realization of everything that had been spoken, and there it is laying right there before them, it says they left with loud proclamations and praise and worship, and they share it with everybody. You see, there's no way you could come in here rejoicing, and there's no way you can leave rejoicing. There's no way you can live Monday through Saturday rejoicing in all that Jesus Christ has done if you are not in relationship with Him or if something is amiss. You can't do it. You cannot praise somebody who sacrificed so much when we're making light of that sacrifice. Paul also goes on to say, can't have confidence moving forward. You cannot stand in the face of the adversary. And you cannot have peace, no matter what's going on, without first circumcising your heart. You see, there are a lot of people. I don't know why this, this is coming to my mind. Let me tell you the problem with Christians and Christianity. Because just like what happened with this, it becomes an outward ritual and look. You see, they profess Jesus Christ. They, they, they carry their Bibles. I mean, we, we could go down the analogy. But if you really talk to them, they have no peace and they have no confidence that God can bring them through this moment, this trial, this circumstance. They lack confidence. Why is that? Where is their relationship at with God? Simple. Because Scripture says you cannot have an alt with a brother and still be in the Lord. Doesn't mean they'll forgive you. Doesn't mean they'll go on. You see, we're looking at murderers and thieves and, and liars. And I mean, we could go right on all these, all these huge, well, we won't call them huge sins. But if you'll notice, and every time Paul brings that up, the gossiper is right there with the murder because you kill with the tongue just as good as you can with a gun or anything else. And so what happens in modern day Christianity is because of the lies we speak. Because of the lies and, and character assassinations. People talking about other people. Then they wonder why they have no peace. Because they got unconfessed sin, something deep down inside that they have not brought before God. Now, like I said, and it has not been easy, and I, look, I'm not perfect. No, by no stretch of the imagination. But God has led me at times in the past, and I did this on the advice of a pastor friend. This was years ago. God tells you, put somebody in your heart, and you go to them, and you ask for forgiveness, even if you weren't wrong in the situation. And I've done that. It was not easy. Didn't want to do it. 
but I felt better when I left. Now, whether they truthfully forgive or not, that's on them. But I've done my part. I've released me. And so maybe that's what we need to do with some family members, with some people. We need to begin to pray. Lord, if there's somebody that I have an alt against, reveal it to me. Help me to understand how to handle it. But then we need to handle it. Whether we go to them face to face, or whether we write them a letter, or if they're past and they've gone on to be with the Lord, then write the letter and burn the letter. But we need to get it under the blood of Jesus. We cannot go forward as a church in one mind, one accord. Our hearts aren't right. Luke 2, 21, the last half of that verse. His name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, I want to share with you, and I'm going to do my best, because I want us to understand what's going on right here. We're still in the, in the process of the circumcision, but also circumcision and the naming of the child go hand in hand. There is a very intricate ceremony that's going on, and it's all centered, believe it or not, around this covenant and around the name. Now, we know right here, and according to Scripture, that they named him Jesus. Remember, the angel told them, his name shall be called Jesus. So when you go back and you look and do the original Hebrew, his name is Yeshua. They have no J's. So it's Yeshua. It can also be further translated. Yeshua meaning Joseph. So his name is Jesus, or like I said, in ancient or the older Hebrew, it could also be the name Joseph. That's going to be very interesting here in a moment. But the name Jesus or the name Joseph both entail the Lord saves. So when they named that child, he was not only coming to, to remind them that the Lord saves, but he was coming to save. Here's what's going on in this ceremony. They bring their baby in. They come before the priest who's standing in all his garments. And what the priest asked the father. So the priest would be asking Joseph at this time. One simple question. Holy unto the Lord or redeemed? That's all he would ask him. Holy to the Lord or redeemed? Now the father and mother would have gotten together before this ceremony because they knew what was coming. Because Scripture tells us that when God called this nation unto Himself, He called, He wanted all the men to be priests in His house and in His temple. But when sin took place, and, and, and we know the golden calf things happened, then the priesthood was given to the Levites. But that's not how it was originally intended. It was meant for all. So this priest would come in and he would say, Holy unto the Lord or redeemed. So the father and the, or the, yeah, the, father and the mother would get together, make their decision. Because at this time and at this question, if they had responded wholly unto the Lord, then when he became of age, then he would be carried to the temple and raised in the temple by the priest, much like Samuel was in the Old Testament. Because she had dedicated him back to God. So if the family had dedicated him in the service of God, then the child would have been given, turned over to the temple to serve the Lord all the days of his life. But if the mother and the father chose redemption. That means they were buying back their child. They had the option to buy him back. And so what they would do is they would take five shekels of silver, which is the price of redemption. They would hand these shekels across. Uh, they would, it would be passed over the baby into the hands of the priest. Most often when the ceremony was over with, the priest would give the money back. It was a sign or symbol that they have bought this family back. This is why I find this very interesting. Remember, Jesus' name means the Lord saves, but it's also the name Joshua. So when you go back and you begin to look throughout the, the Bible, because this is what they teach, this is what it reminds them of. If you'll remember, Jacob had a whole bunch of sons. One was his favorite. What was his name? Joseph. Why did I say Joshua a while ago? Jesus' name means Joseph. Let me, let me make that correction. I know I have just muddied the water right then. His name is Joseph. 
Joshua, good Lord, bad day. You'll get it here in a minute if I can keep names straight. Father's name was Joseph. Joshua. All right, so here we go. So, here, so as they're, it reminds the people that when they pass these five shekels of silver over to the priest, it carries them back to when Joseph's brothers, Jacob's, good Lord have mercy. They threw him in a pit. And remember, they sold him into slavery and he went down to Egypt. Well, the price of that, when you go back, and I can't remember the exact word that was written in Genesis, but it equals five shekels of silver. So it's the same price that his brothers received when they sold him into slavery. It's the same price they pass over the baby when they say redeemed. So they're bringing the baby back. But we also know that story, that God put him into Potiphar's house. He was falsely accused cast into prison. He interpreted two dreams while he was in prison. Later, when one remembered, he was brought out of the prison. He was put in second in command of Egypt. And while he was in Egypt, uh, great, uh, God, he had a dream. And so they uh, stored up all the grain for seven years because there were seven years of famine coming. And he saved his family, his household, the land, and the land of Egypt. I want to remind you of something because uh, th this, is how, this is just how I see what is happening and what is going on in our text. Because we're about to transition from Christmas, and we're out asking the question, now what? And so when I began to uncover what this ceremony and then passing and what was going on, this is what I want to remind you of this morning. Is that not only are we celebrating the birth, but we're saying, Jesus saves. And I know things are looking bad. We don't know what direction things are going. Those things seem very quiet at this moment. But I want to remind you of what the symbolic and what the parallel and the type and shadow between Jesus Christ and the coat of many colors. And the reason why is because of the tremendous parallels that I believe we're getting ready to see happen. Because there was a time he was thrown into a pit. He found favor. But he was falsely accused. You see... What is happening in the body of Christ right now and what is causing a great division are the false accusations from one church to the next. And so he was cast into a prison. He was cast into uh, the, the, the cell there. He had a dream. Well, they had dreams. He interpreted the dreams. Let me, let me just remind you, God still speaks through dreams and visions. God still speaks to His people. We were just talking about this this morning. Uh, that's why it went into more of a Bible study than it did practice. But we were talking about how God... Look, there are things that you, uh, that you have been dealing with, that you have seen. You don't understand the full meaning of them right now. You're, like we were talking about this morning, you're trying to d differentiate. Is this God revealing something to you? Or is this you know, how you think things ought to work out? And sometimes that is difficult to differentiate between the two. But here's what I want to remind you of this morning. That God did speak a word. He spoke that word before that child was born. He gave him dreams while he was a little lad running around with that coat of many colors and others got jealous of his gifting. What we are about to see and it's going to escalate is when the gifts and the talents that God has brought to this church and when they begin to be empowered by the Spirit of God not many days from now and as we transition into what God is about to do there are going to be others who become jealous that the giftings are being enacted within this house. And as these giftings are, are, are being manifest, manifested right here before our eyes and in this house and through the instruments that God has brought to this house, it's going to cause other people to become very jealous. They'll want to get rid of us. They'll want to see us go right on down into a pit. But see, what we have to realize is in that pit, God has already given us two people who's eventually going to be our way out. Because they've been placed there as well. Some under false accusations, some need to be there. But what God does is He places people in it. Now look, Joshua gave that man the interpretation of a dream. They were released. Here he was for a number of months or years in front of, in front of um, Pharaoh. And then all of a sudden one day, oh yeah, I ran into this guy in prison. And he's an interpreter of dreams, and God speaks to him, and that's who you need to bring up. And when he brought him up, he didn't go back to being in Potiphar's house. He went back to being second in command of all the land. 
what I'm trying to tell you today is it may get a little rougher before it gets better. But what I can rest, you can rest assured of, what God has already spoken and what He has already released is going to come to pass just as He spoke it. What He spoke over that night that this board sat in a room and I was not there, whatever it was they experienced, whatever it was they heard, they know God spoke a word over this church. And guys, I'm here to tell you and to encourage you, God does not speak unless there is a purpose behind Him speaking. And if He spoke that night, and what you know, it will come to pass just as God spoke it. It may get rougher before it gets better. But if God spoke it, you see, God is going to place someone who's going to say, Oh yeah, I remember about them over there. And you don't go back to doing what you did before. Because there's a greater purpose and a greater calling that God had for you. And that was to save Egypt and to save His family. And what I'm trying to tell you is, there's a greater purpose to this church. And when we go into next year, and the Spirit of God begins to move through this church, we're not going to go back and do, if we keep going back doing what we used to do, expecting different results, that's insanity. But God is saying, I'm not calling you out of the muck, the mire, and the prison, and the darkness for you to go back and do what you did before. I've got something new in store for you. And when the newness comes, it's greater than where you were before. And when this newness comes, you're going to speak into the land of Egypt. You're going to speak into a pagan world. And you're going, because what eventually happened? God showed them He was God against all ten of the deities that they worshipped with the plagues in Egypt. But His people were kept safe, and not one of them was found out, uh, ill, health, or lame when they left and went to claim their inheritance. I'm just here to tell you, because it's stirring inside of me so strong, I don't know exactly what's happening. I don't know exactly how this thing will transpire. What I do know is that when my God spoke it, it's going to happen. We need to get ready. Because we're going to witness to Egypt, Newburn and Craven County. And we're going to be uh, brought up to be able to save, not only save Egypt, but to save our own families. That is the witness that this church is going to have moving forward. Let me tell you the reason for this celebration of this service. I, I, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked. It's to remind them, God is your salvation. God is your strength. God is your hope. There is no other place to look. Let me tell you what happened every time they brought a male child in to be circumcised. They began to look at Genesis 3.15. And they began to look, and, they, and this, is what the, 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 this is what the mother says. You remember the, God, the, the man stands there and makes the redeemed or holy unto the Lord. But let me tell you what the mother says when the child is circumcised. Satan, you didn't get this seed. You didn't take his life. We're dedicating Him wholly unto God or unto Him. We're, 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 we're continuing to establish and perpetuate the covenant that our God made with it. Start with Abraham and it's still going today. And you haven't touched this seed. Let me tell you, as long as we are in covenant with God and as long as we keep perpetuating that covenant promise that God has made, the enemy cannot touch this seed. The enemy cannot take what God has already planted. Oh, come on now. God, the enemy cannot do it. It's reminding him, you can't steal it. You can't touch it. See, it reminds him of the night the death angel passed over as well. And when the blood was applied over the doorpost, it had to go on by. But you heard the Egyptians cry out because their firstborn was dying. Look, as long as the blood is applied, now I can't understand and I can't explain to you today why bad things happen to good people. I mean, we cannot go through that. We just have to understand. We, God knows. But what I can rest assured is, there's an inheritance coming. Jesus Christ is coming back. He's coming back and going to sound a trump. There's going to be a shout that says, come up hither to where I am at. See, there's something greater that's coming that we all, must, that we all miss, but... Those who apply the blood to the doorpost and walk under the power and the anointing of God will see the inheritance of God. See, there's something here else going on. Silver trays, jewelry, and coins. So I've told you about the shekels. 
Well, when the baby is brought in, it's either a piece of cloth for poor people. Richer people had a prayer shawl. And they would lay the baby on this prayer shawl. And the baby, the prayer shawl, was laid on a silver tray. And while the circumcision took place and while the naming of the child took place, the women in attendance that day would begin to remove their jewelry, place the jewelry all around the child on that silver tray. It reminded them the night they left Egypt to go to the inheritance. Remember, the Egyptians heaped all sorts of riches on them just so they leave and leave them alone. This should serve as a time of great reflection. A time of great reflection. So I, I, that's what I, I just want to take a moment because I, I began to reflect. Because if we don't reflect, we'll lose heart. And I began to think about some of the salvation decisions that were made this year. People who either came to the altar or they went into the, 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 the office or, or, or might, might, we might have met them on the street. And we had the opportunity to lead them to the Lord. And we get the opportunity to look the enemy right in the eye and say, you didn't take that seed. You didn't harm that seed. Some of them were sons of women that we've all, we've all been enjoying their ministry for years, Sunday school teachers. You know, they would do plays in the church. And their sons came and asked Christ to be their Lord and Savior. The enemy did not get that seed. Praise God. And there's going to be a lot of other seeds he ain't going to touch either. Let me tell you what else happened. God always has. And He always will provide what we need. God has always provided. He's always been right on time. And for whatever God is about to call us into in the future, don't know what it is, don't know the expense. I always go back to that verse. The wealth of the wicked is laid up in store for the righteous. My God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God will always provide. So if there's any source of encouragement this morning, keep looking up and keep moving ahead. The same God then is the same God today and will be the same God tomorrow. And will be the same God forever and ever. Luke 2.22 now when the days of purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The events of verse 21 take place the seventh and eighth day after the child is born. Verses 22 through 24 take place about 33 days later, coming up, and it has to be 40 days. So this last portion, and this is... Also why I've missed this, because it says in the one verse where it looks like they brought the child to be dedicated unto the Lord. He was dedicated when he was circumcised and named. So when you begin to look at this text, what we must understand about verse 22 through 24 is this has nothing to do with the child, but has everything to do with Mary. You see, two turtle doves were the sacrifice of poor people. The lamb was for the rich. This sacrifice was to mark the conclusion of what would be known as her days of purity since the birth of the child. Now within that is, uh, is several different things. We, we don't have time to get into them today, but like a water purification service and the process of getting that water purified. But 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What we must understand about a purification process is though we do not do the rites and rituals as they did then, we have a daily process that we must go through. The Apostle Paul says, I crucify my flesh daily. So it is a daily process in which we are asking God, Lord, I want to make sure I am in a right relationship with you. So I don't know anybody that would be exempt from this type of cleansing. Like I said, the Apostle Paul even said, the things I do not want to do, that's what I do. And the things I do want to do, I don't do them. 
But he says, I crucify my flesh daily. You see, it's all about bringing ourselves back into right alignment with Almighty God. It's about the removal of any outward sin or anything that would pollute the soul and the spirit of a man or person. In Hebrews 12, verse 14, it says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. To me, that's very plain and simple. So when we do this outward, outward uh, or this, this inward, circumcision of the heart, God search me and know me. And we think about this entire ceremony that, I, that I've kind of somewhat laid out before you. This entire ceremony is a picture and a lesson of holiness. Being holy before God. Remember, it was Peter who, who would uh, reiterate the verse, Be holy, for I am holy. See, it's about living holy and acceptable lives before God. I didn't say perfect. No one here is perfect. But it's about a daily striving, getting rid of the attitude, getting rid of the, you know, whatever it is that is polluting these souls and spirits and going after God. We're called to be in this world and to affect this world or be of it but not in it. In other words, we can't let this world get inside of us and pollute this soul and pollute this spirit. Now, holiness in the deep south deals a lot with outward appearance. Growing up, it was about what you could and could not eat or drink or where you could and could not go. And that is a total misrepresentation of holiness. Holiness is setting a standard of morality for our lives and for our families that we will live by. And those moralities are found in Scripture. It's about setting a standard of godly living that is far above anything of this world. So that when people see us and they see how we live, they know something is different about them. And that's because we have set this, this moral standard. And look, your standard and my standard are two different standards. So don't set a standard expecting everybody else to live by your standard. Let me close with this. Luke 2.24 and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of God, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. As I said, the sacrifice mentioned was for Mary's purification, not Christ's dedication. So let us look at it in this manner. Mary and Joseph chose two turtle doves. The price for her purification for someone who was poor. But in their presence was Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sins of the world, the most expensive of all the sacrifices. The doves, we know, represent the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture. And it requires the blood of Jesus and the help of the Holy Spirit to navigate what tomorrow holds. The only way in which we're going to live holy unto God is through and by the blood of Jesus Christ. The only way to have access to the throne of God is by the blood of Jesus Christ. The only way to have our name written in the Lamb's book of life is by the blood of Jesus Christ. After which, the endowment of power from on high comes from the indwelling of the Spirit of God. That is what allows us to be able to stand and withstand in this evil day as the Spirit of God directs us. So now what? If each and every one of us will be honest, nobody knows the future. Only God holds the future. What I am assured of is we cannot afford to lose what we have learned and experienced over this particular season. The peace, the love, and the joy of God. The only way in which we can maintain and not lose it is by the blood of Jesus Christ, the 
power of the Spirit of God. I am more convinced now, probably now more than ever before, that we've got to pray like we never have. Just as if our lives depend on it, because trust me, it does. But not just pray. We've got to pray in the Spirit. You can't pray in the Spirit with an uncircumcised heart. Worship will have to become an integral part of our lives. Apart from our normally scheduled services. Because it's worship that breaks yokes. It's worship that breaks bonds. And it's worship that sets an atmosphere in which the enemy flees because our God becomes exalted. It is about a daily walk and a daily sacrifice. So for something to be sacrificed, what does it mean? It's got to die. We must die to self. Our wants, our desires, our will, our way. And it must be full submission to who God is. Because if we fully submit to Him moving forward from today, I'm just telling you, it doesn't matter what tomorrow holds. It really doesn't. Because you'll have peace in the middle of all of it. My mind goes back to, and there are several accounts, Peter, Paul, Silas, different ones, thrown into prison, facing certain death, uncertainty, in the face of a tyrannical government. And what did they do? They sing, and they praise, and they worship God until the balls were open. But not only was Peter in there praying and singing while he was in prison, but there was a remnant of believers in a house that had gathered together, praying, I, I believe, praying under the unction and the anointing of the Spirit of God, according to Scripture. I'm trying to remember how that saying went. The angel may have fetched Peter out of the prison, but it was prayer that fetched the angel. You see, prayer, getting in one mind, one accord, going after God, that's the answer to the now what. Going after God with everything we had, and it begins with us. So everybody please stand up.